This is the uh, Anchor Cross edition of the Robinson Pierpont Greek New Testament. It's a blue hardback and I will be showing it comparing the size and the text with the Trinitarian Bible Society's Greek New Testament which is a bit taller and not quite as wide. The United Bible Society's 5th edition which is a thicker volume, a little bit shorter, and not quite as wide. Also with yellow paper, the Nestle Elan 28th edition, very similar in size to the United Bible Society's 5th edition. And the uh, Tyndall House Greek New Testament, which is taller and thicker but not so wide. We'll just step right into it now. This book is seven and three quarters inches tall, six inches wide, and fifteen and sixteenths inches thick. The paper is uh, 51 micrometers thick with an estimated paper weight of 47 GSM. It is in a singer, single column paragraph type format as you see here. The column is about 89 millimeters wide with about 58 characters per line. Page dimensions are 191 millimeters tall and 141 millimeters wide. That's 7.5 inches tall, 5.6 inches wide. Margins at the top are 13 and at the bottom is about 13 millimeters as well. The inner margin can be as much as 27 millimeters, so you see there it's quite large. And the outer margin is about 22. The font here in the text is about 9.5 points, equivalent to the symbol font. That is, when I compare it with a symbol font, it matches nicely at about 9.5. The line height, which you see looks fairly generous there, is about 11.5. Uh, pica points, or one pica point is 0.3514 millimeters. Uh, unlike the Trinitarian Bible Society Greek New Testament, it does show the verse numbers in the text. It has um, two kinds of apparatuses. We'll look at the introduction in a minute and it will explain how these are used, but there's a marginal apparatus which shows variants within the Byzantine text form. And then there's the lower apparatus. And the lower apparatus shows where the Byzantine reading on the left differs from the Nestle Elan 27th edition or the UBS 4 reading on the right. You'll see that um, the book titles are center top of the page. Page numbers are in the center bottom of the page. There are no headings within the text. There is a preface at the beginning of the book, just after the table of contents. And at the very end, there is an extremely interesting appendix, which is an essay by Maurice Robertson, Robinson called uh, The Case for Byzantine Priority. Um, we won't be talking about the essay in detail. I think it actually might be worth making a video about this essay as a standalone video. The uh, font in the preface and in the um, appendix is about a 9.5 point Times New Roman equivalent. The paper here is relatively opaque. There isn't uh, very much gloss to it. Um, it's uh, pr printed crisply. See, there's not much blurring there. Sharp, sharply distinguished uh, characters. There's not much of a newsprint effect either, although these characters are not quite as dark and bold as I would have liked uh, because the paper is somewhat uh, opaque. You don't get that newsprint effect where you have a gray gray character is on a kind of a grayish background, the dingy look. So we don't have to worry about that here. 
There is some uh, moderate print non-uniformity, and perhaps I can get us there quickly. We'll look at pages 359 and 361 as an example. And you see this kind of variation here, not infrequently. This is rather representative and characteristic of the print non-uniformity in this book. So on the right, printed uh, relatively boldly. On the left, somewhat lightly. That is about as bad as it gets here in the book. So let's back up and we'll show the book. We've seen the outside. This is the anchor cross symbol here. New Testament in the original Greek. This is one of uh, two majority text or Byzantine traditional text uh, editions that you can get. Uh, the other one is the Hodges Farstead majority text. So this one's usually refer referred to as the Byzantine text, or the Byzantine text form by Maurice Robinson and uh, Robert Pierpont. And the other one is referred to as the majority text, and it's by Zane Hodges and Arthur Farstad. And they're slightly different. And if you're interested in seeing a video about the different traditional text positions, I recommend a video by Robert Trulove on YouTube. His YouTube channel is called um, Something of Reformed Adam. Well, I'll put it. Uh, I'll put a note in the video to explain it. And he has a very good video that talks about the different traditional text positions, the majority text position, the Byzantine text position, one called F35, uh, the traditional um, Textus Receptus position, and then one he calls uh, Textus Receptus um, priority position. Traditional and normal hardback binding, no vinyl as you would find in the uh, Tyndall House Greek New Testament. The title page, copyright page, and uh, copyright is by Robinson and Pierpont, but essentially they put it in the public domain. Um, you can reproduce this, um, and uh, I think all they ask is that it be annotated uh, some way. We release into the public domain the introduction and the appendix, which have been especially prepared for this edition. Um, all rights to this text are released to everyone, and no one can reduce these rights at any time. Um, here's the table of contents. And um, the books are almost in the same order as in the Tyndall House Greek New Testament. So you have the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, then Acts, and then you have the Catholic epistles. So you have James, First and Second Peter, um, the Three John. Uh, epistles, and then Jude, and then the epistles of Paul, starting with Romans, the two Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, first and second Thessalonians. This is where it differs from Tyndall House. Tyndall House puts Hebrews at the end, right before the apocalypse. So, um, Robinson Pierpont put um, Hebrews before first and second Timothy, Titus, and Philemon. And then it ends up with the appendix listed there, beginning on page 557, the case for Byzantine priority. Preface, and I think all I'll do here in the preface is to say that um, the Byzantine priority position is one that says that the texts <clears throat> that were preserved in the old Byzantine Empire um, which generally are late and written as minuscules, that those represent uh, more accurately the original Greek text than those papyri and uh, unseal manuscripts that seem to have an Egyptian provenance. And the appendix at the back gives uh, Maurice Robinson's argument for why he thinks that's true. And I think it's, uh, it's very well thought out and it's a reasonable approach. I won't say that I'm completely convinced by it, but um, I certainly wouldn't want anyone to think that my position, my opinion on this matter is really weighty, because I know very little about it. This is a, their discussion of the marginal apparatus. <clears throat> the main text displays the Byzantine text form. 
Where Byzantine manuscripts are strongly united, the main text stands without marginal comment. Where the manuscripts comprising the Byzantine text form are significantly divided, superior angle brackets mark the affected word or words in the main text. And then the lower apparatus simply, the discussion here simply says what we saw earlier, that they use a diamond. This is not the diamond of uncertainty that one finds in Tyndall House or in uh, the UBS 5, <clears throat> but rather it's simply a diamond that separates the majority text readings, I mean the Byzantine text readings, from the reasoned eclectic text readings of uh, Nestle Elan 27 or UBS 4. <clears throat> And after the introduction, you come to Matthew. And so you see the paragraph by paragraph format on the apparatus at the bottom of the page. We go in a few pages before we find the first use of the marginal apparatus. So we have Robinson Pierpont on a stand now, and we'll do some font comparisons, starting with the Trinitarian Bible Societies. Uh, Texas Receptus, so that's on the right, and Robinson Pierpont is on the left. The paper here is a bit more opaque on the right, and the font is bolder. Uh, it's actually much nicer on the right uh, in every way, except that the printing is not as crisp. As I pointed out in other videos, it's a little hard sometimes to distinguish um, the uh, diacritical marks well in the TBS but otherwise it's a very nice read. There's nothing wrong with this on the left, though. It's still quite nice. Oh, and by the way, it, uh, it occurred to me that uh, Robert Trulove's YouTube channel is called uh, Backwaters of Reformedom. So now on the right you have um, United Bible Society's 5th edition, and you can see that's a quite pleasant font on the right as well. And one thing that they do in UBS that they don't do here in Robinson Pierpont is um, mark for you quotations from the Old Testament. Those are in bold here on the right. But uh, still both of these texts, I think, are usable and quite attractive aesthetically. Uh, similarly, we have uh, the... Um, the Elan 28th edition, it has a very wide margin, so it's hard to get them both in the same camera picture. Well, the paper in the uh, NA28 is kind of creamy, and I like that, but it's also thinner paper and with more show through, so I think perhaps this is a bit more of a pleasant reading experience, although I have no problem with either one. And, um, I think the Tyndall House Greek New Testament may have done the best job of all because it's printed very nice and crisply, but the paper is more opaque in it than in any of the other editions. So you have the advantage of having uh, white paper with a dark print on it with little show through. Also the line spacing here is very nicely done. Again, both of them very good. I have no real complaints about either. Um, because I'm talking about a uh, Byzantine New Testament text today, it seemed like it would be a good time to draw something of a contrast between this Byzantine text form and the Trinitarian Bible Society's uh, Greek New Testament text, which differs slightly. And the reason I think it's kind of important to do that is um, in my experience recently having been exposed to something I'm calling here a confessional position, which is based on the Westminster Confession, Chapter 1, Section 8, which reads in part, the Old Testament in Hebrew and the New Testament in Greek being immediately inspired by God and by His singular care and providence kept pure in all ages, are therefore authentical. That word authentical there is a kind of a connection to the Council of Trent, which has um, a, a statement that says that the Latin Vulgate is in fact authentical. So here the reformers uh, in the middle of the 17th century are saying, well, no, it's the Old Testament Hebrew and the New Testament in Greek, not the Latin, that are kept pure in all ages and are all authentical. Now, some who hold this position uh, consider the Textus Receptus 
to be the New Testament in Greek that's been kept pure in all ages, which puzzles me because it first appeared in 1516, as far as I know, and underwent multiple revisions since that then, at least until 1641. And if you consider the, the uh, Trinitarian Bible Society's edition, the uh, Texas Receptus, then at least until 1894, when Scrivener came up with that text, it's been being modified. Now, some people who hold a position like this are, um, there's a guy who um, has a um, podcast named Jeff Riddle. He's a pastor in Virginia, and if you go to Sermon Audio and search for Jeff Riddle or for text criticism, you'll find his Word magazine, and he has a number of episodes where he defends the Textus Receptus. Uh, another person who has a similar position is the late uh, Robert Paul Wieland, who has, uh, ha who had a uh, YouTube channel, and some of his videos are very good, where he uh, defends Textus Receptus readings against the critics. And then I would put Robert Trulove as almost in this camp. Robert Trulove uh, characterizes his position as Textus Receptus priority, <coughs> and he seems to mean by that that. Uh, he knows it's not perfect, but it's about the best that we have. I'm uh, fighting allergies today, so we're unfortunately having to break the video up for places it need not break. Um, Robert Trulove, I believe, would say uh, something along the lines that um, the text is 98% good, at least, and um, for pastoral reasons, we should just stick with that text and not change it all the time. Uh, as, as the textual critics make decisions and uh, vary the readings as time goes on. Now I have a couple of observations about this, uh, this confessional position. Um, one is that the New Testament quotes a text, when it's quoting the Old Testament, it te quotes a text that resembles the Septuagint, yet the readings have not been preserved in the Masoretic text, and yet they say that the Masoretic text at least people who hold this position seem to say it's the Masoretic text that's been preserved by the providence of God. I'm not sure why we would say that. Um, I point uh, here in my sub-bullet to some work that was done some years ago now about New Testament quotations of the Old Testament, and then I invite you to take a look at those. Um, many of the Greek New Testament manuscripts have been preserved to include the papyrus fragments and the ancient unseals. We have many, many uh, existing manuscripts, and they've all been preserved. So why pick an engineered New Testament text that was crafted in the 16th century as being the text that was providentially preserved? I don't understand that. Uh, most New Testament manuscripts differ from the Textus Receptus in significant ways, and we will see that shortly. So I just want to want to say, you know, these these people are very bright. Um, they've studied these issues much more than I have, um, and they've come to the conclusion that the Textus Receptus is the way to go. Um, but frankly, I just don't understand why yet, and. Uh, I want to go and point out here momentarily some of the differences between the Robinson Pierpont Greek text and the Textus Receptus. So we'll do that shortly. It's also not clear to me that why uh, the Word of God would have to be preserved in the original languages. Why can't God have preserved it in a translation like the Latin Vulgate? It, uh, it just doesn't seem to follow to me. So this is our first example of uh, places where the Byzantine text and the TBS Textus Receptus differ. This is Luke uh, 1736, and here uh, the TBS Textus Receptus translated into English would say, two shall be in the field, the one shall be taken, and the other left. Uh, and Bruce Metzger says that it's possible that, it, although this verse possibly may have been um, emitted accidentally in view of the weighty manuscript authority supporting the shorter text, that is, omission, it's more probable that copyists assimilated the passage to Matthew 2440, which is somewhat similar, and that's from uh, Metzger's textual commentary. The passage is absent, though, from uh, George Ricker Berry's The Inner 
linear Greek English New Testament, which is based on uh, Stephanus, Stephen's uh, 1550, and it's missing, as you would expect, from the 1560 Geneva Bible, but it's present in Elsevier in 1624. So here's an example that not only of where the TBS Textus Receptus differs from the Byzantine text, but also um, the Textus Receptus seems to differ with itself. Uh, Stevens disagrees with Elsevier. Um, <clears throat> the uh, next example is Acts 8, 36-37. And here um, we have the baptism of the Ethiopian eunuch. And the key point here is that although the Textus Receptus includes uh, Philip's requirement that the eunuch make a confession of the faith. The eunuch says, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That confession of faith, the question from Peter and the answer from the eunuch, are absent from the Byzantine text. Uh, I have heard some people, and these, these uh, tend to be King James only type people, um, claim that uh, verse 37 was deliberately removed because it in, embarrassed the pedo baptists the people who baptize infants. Um, but it really doesn't say anything that would be embarrassing to pedo baptists because they as well require a confession of faith prior to baptism from adults. If an adult is going to be baptized in a Pado Baptist church, he must, he, sh he or she must uh, can confess belief in Jesus. Third example is Acts nine uh, five through six. Here um, there is an insertion. It appears in the Textus Receptus. Um, this is where Paul um, has his in Damascus Road experience and. He says, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, who thou persecutest. And then we have these words that read, It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be shown to thee. So um, the words in blue are in the Textus Receptus, but not in the majority text. Although similar languages in Acts 26.14 and Acts uh, 22.10, according to Bruce Metzger, the spurious passage came into the Textus Receptus when Erasmus translated it from the Latin into the Greek and inserted it into his first edition of the Greek New Testament. So Metzger is saying that this is one of those Latin intrusions, uh, kind of like the comma Johannium. Uh, another example is in 1 John uh, 2.23 where the Textus Receptus, uh, TBS Textus Receptus, includes at the end of the verse, but he that acknowledgeth the Son hath the Father also. Those words are absent from the Byzantine text. They also appear to be absent from uh, Stephen's 1550, at least according to uh, George Rickerberry's interlinear Greek-English New Testament, which George Rickerberry says is based on Stephen's 1550. Um, but uh, those words are included in um, the margin of the 1560 Geneva Bible. So the Geneva Bible translators were aware of them, but they thought they were not genuine, and they put them in the margin. And they are in italics in most italicized King James Bibles, which indicates that the King James Bible translators uh, also didn't consider them genuine. All right, so... Next, um, 1 John 5, 7, and 8. This is the famous comma Jehanium, and it is entirely absent from the Byzantine text. And I included a passage here from Metzger where he theorizes as to how the, uh, the, the language um, perhaps got written into a margin of a Latin manuscript and then found its way from the margin into the text and then from the text of the Latin into the very few Greek manuscripts that actually have it. The overwhelming majority of Greek New Testament texts, that is the late ones that are in minuscules that came from the Byzantine Empire, not the Egyptian ones, but the Byzantine ones, that fled uh, after the fall of Constantinople into the West, fled into the West and after 15, 1453, those do not have that language. All right, uh, this one's kind of interesting. This is just a rearrangement. The Texas Receptus has three verses at the end of chapter 16 in Romans, 
and the Byzantine text places those three verses at the end of chapter 14 in Romans. So your Romans um, chapter 14 ends with verse 23, but a Byzantine text, cha Romans chapter 14, would end with verse 26. There's also a minor insertion in the last verse, uh, the words to whom, which you'll see in blue there. <clears throat> um, Colossians 1, 13 through 14. Um, the insertion of the words through his blood. Now you hear on uh, King James only, people say that they're trying to omit the blood of Jesus. But the phrase through his blood is still in Ephesians 1, 7. And the thought is that it um, was interpolated into Colossians from Ephesians 1, 7. It is not in the majority of the Byzantine texts, but it is in Textus Receptus. So what I don't understand is why someone would choose the Textus Receptus, which has known intrusions which are not in the Byzantine text, and still claim that what they're, what they're in favor of is the, the traditional text. They're in favor of um, a rel relatively recent tradition, it seems to me, one that uh, originated in the 16th century. <clears throat> Revelation 16.5 is another example. Here the Textus Receptus, the TBS Textus Receptus uh, says, uh, Thou art righteous, O Lord, which art and wast and shalt be. Whereas the Byzantine text says, uh, Thou art righteous, O Lord, which art and wast, O Holy One. The Trinitarian Bible Society's Greek New Testament has and shalt be, but Stephen's 1550 agrees with the Byzantine text, almost, and Stephen's inc included an and before it, so it reads and the Holy One. But uh, you can see that um, the Geneva Bible, which I've quoted there in this place, reads as the Byzantine text. So exactly where and shalt be came from is not clear to me. Perhaps some historian watching this video can enlighten us with a comment down below. Revelation 22.19 is my last example. And here we have uh, the major difference is um, tree and book. Um, the Texas Receptus has book here, and the story is that Erasmus translated, because he didn't have a Greek text for the end of Revelation, he translated the um, Latin into Greek. And the Latin had an error here because someone thought that the Latin word uh, ligno was actually libro. So they replaced tree with book at some point. And then that error came into Erasmus's Greek New Testament when he translated Latin into Greek to create his Greek text. The majority of texts, the traditional text of the Greek New Testament, the one that was traditionally preserved in the Greek-speaking part of the world says tree there. The other slight difference is that uh, in the Greek, in the Byzantine text, there's an optative there rather than an indicative, and it says may God rather than God shall. So that's the end of our examples. There are numerous other differences between the Textus Receptus and uh, Robinson Beer Pierpont's uh, Byzantine text. Most of them are not translatable. I think I did capture most of the more interesting ones here. So we'll, we'll summarize now. Um, on the downside, um, I could wish that the print were printed, uh, the text were printed a bit more uniformly and a bit darker. I would also like the paper to be just a bit thicker, although this is pretty good, I mean it, but it's, it's not bad, but I would like it to be a bit thicker. Um, in the appendix, although certainly not in the Greek text to my notice, you occasionally have uh, proofreading errors like this, where words were allowed to join. Someone should have inserted a space there. Um, you find that not infrequently. Uh, here's another example, just two pages earlier, where the in entire are merged together. And then there are, there are things like this, where someone perhaps could have put in a hyphen somewhere to add more text to that line and gotten rid of those large gaps. And here's another run together. 
Um, but again, I don't find those in the Greek text. The Greek text seems to have been formatted well. On the plus side, um, the, uh, there's no, no copyright to this. You can use as much of this as you please in any form you please. Um, it is uh, the text that was used in the Byzantine Empire. Um, it is printed uh, crisply and you can make out all the diacritical marks easily. The uh, binding is sewn and it lies flat easily and it has an attractive uh, satin ribbon marker. So altogether I think it's a, it's a quite good value. It's not very expensive. I don't remember the price exactly, but it was certainly uh, under $30. It may have been about $25. Well, I hope you've uh, enjoyed this review of the Robinson and Pierpont um, New Testament in the Original Greek, published by Anchor Cross Publishing. If you did, remember to like, and um, I encourage you to subscribe to the channel. It's really grown quite a lot lately. Thanks very much. Uh, for watching this video.